Hey guys, I'm here with Ken Yaris, a uh, fine art extraordinaire and western painter, landscape painter. That's right. And we're here to do a studio tour. So do you have any uh, initial thoughts or anything? Or? Just don't mind the mess. We're going into a work zone here. Dude, that's crazy. And it's spins a fire comes up. Yeah, so I share the studio first off with an artist named Richie Carter. So we split it down the middle here. So there's two artists at work, but right now I've got a solo show opening in about a month. So everything that you see is a part of that process. It's definitely not all painting. A lot of people think about being an artist is hanging out, using a brush all day. And there's a lot of screwdrivers and computer work and other kind of admin stuff. So like I said, this is a work zone. And right now we are in final show prep. So I'm in the process of getting paintings mounted into frames. Varnishing is a big step right now. For example, this art show that's coming up is called Steadfast. Yep. And so we're working on all that, but this is the initial drawing that I did for that headlining painting. Yeah. But I did it all just digitally, because oh, I'm allowed so. to like, yeah. I feel like, unlike traditional media, I have a lot more playground feeling with this. I can right. totally nuke it, create a new layer. I actually did some color layering on it too. So all of that allows me to have so much more flexibility. Mm -hmm. But this computer station, all that multimedia stuff is a big deal for my creative process. Yeah. You know, it's landscape painting, painting plain air, it's all about capturing that like grand sense of scale. Right. And my old monitor was about as big as that lower one. Yeah. And it felt like everything was just so small being able to work on this big screen that was actually cheaper than a really nice monitor, but I don't use it for the same thing. Yeah. So I'll pull my big references up and then be able to paint in this zone with a bit more of that right. sensation that it's like Absolutely. big and epic feeling. Well, I, when I started talking to fine artists tomorrow, I was really surprised by how much prep work that everyone does. Oh, Taking man. tons of reference photos, getting every single lighting scenario figured out beforehand. And I think looking at the final image, it's pretty easy to, I guess, assume that people just start with that immediately. But oh, yeah. I, I mean, most of the work might come in the planning versus the actual painting. Right? Yep, the saying I love and, and cling on to and tell students about is well begun is half done. Yeah. You know, if you're caught in the painting not knowing what went wrong, a lot's already wrong. Right. Like you should have had that solved in the thumbnail phase or the reference gathering phase. Like there's so many ways that you vet that process. And another creative part that I think we miss out of in the visual language sometime or the visual artist is you watch like dancers perform right. or actors perform or musicians perform, yeah. you're seeing performance. Yeah. You're not seeing practice, and that's very important that we don't see that. You yeah. know, I think if we were to see these ballerinas work for as long as they did, then like the actual performance doesn't even feel that miraculous. Right. But we don't see that, and I think fine art is that same realm, like you're presenting this painting, this, this performance, and a lot of us artists don't protect it like that. We yeah. kind of learn on the fly. Right. And if you're gonna learn on the fly with a painting, you're gonna probably end up frustrated, yeah. unproductive, and probably creating weaker work than if you were to just keep that practice as its own sacred thing. I guess going to all of these other paintings as well, you know, you, you do tons of different iterations and I, I'd imagine that these are not the first final results that you do. No, there's a lot of studies that go into it and some of them are, like any more of the digital workflow, I find myself doing just sketches there that aren't necessarily final things. Yeah. But my buddy Richie will do very similar iterations of paintings just to help solve those problems. And I think that that is, back to that well begun being half done piece, like yeah. it might seem like tedious work, but it's this refinement process that, yeah. again, I think bands get it, dancers get it. Like, it's like, okay, that one was off. You start over and you do it again. And that, that work ethic and that creative drive is what makes, I think, really excellent things. Well, for, for anyone that's wanting to get started doing those sorts of works and those sorts of like businesses, do you have any uh, thoughts or any advice for them? Or I think it's very important to juggle who you are, what you love, and what is going on in, in real life. Yeah. There's a, obviously, to be an artist is a fantastical you know, it's a romantic, like you said, notion. You get to do what you want, you get to make the things you care about and love, but there's also a lot of the business element that you need to be prepared for yeah. or stay curious about. Like business doesn't have to be a dirty word or a bad word, but you know, like you, you wanna find those people that share that vision and know that it's not just you alone. You will find other artists that have done it before you to kind of have that lineage piece and something you feel safer knowing that this is important or has been done before. But do something that's kind of new too. Just do more information, like do more research. There's an element of like, we all just want to paint. We all just want to do our thing. But a little bit of thought and mentorship, even if it's not you doing the thinking, you partner up with people that have you 
they'll tell you what's going on and give you some insights. That's been huge for my life and yeah. my career is, is having other professional artists that I look up to, other people in the art business world, even galleries and stuff. Like they'll mentor you, they'll help you out. They'll, they want you to succeed too, and and you need them. I think that's it's still. Or if you're going to go and say the social media route, like find the people that do that too. And and it's not. You're never reinventing the wheel with this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Hey guys, before moving on, I wanted to talk about the mentorships I'm starting. If you ever wanted to learn how to draw, where to go in your career, or general advice on being creative, I'm gonna be opening up 10 mentorship sessions per month. What's included is a one hour call per month, direct access to me over Discord, and written critiques and drawovers. Being an artist is really difficult, and having a mentor can save you a lot of time and headache trying to figure out things on your own. Personally, I've spent a lot of time learning from other people through mentorships or classes, and it's been invaluable to my career and my life. Having someone to bounce ideas off of and ask where to go can save you years of trial and error. I'm going to be charging $150 a month, but if you decide it's not exactly what you're looking for, no big deal. I'll give you a full refund. A lot of this stuff is figuring out what works best for you and the kind of teaching style that you prefer. So if you are interested, head to my Patreon, which is linked below, and thanks, and back to the video. I know you went to the Grand Central Atelier, like that drawing on the wall is yours, right? Yes, yes, I mean, and I think I keep that on the wall, I framed it really nice just so I could have that reminder of kind of where I came from, especially when I feel like I'm being lazy with my current paintings that like, man, I used to work really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's cool to see it and it's a good reminder for me where I came from and it's, it's framed there on purpose for sure because school I think is made to push you and I didn't like that when I was going to school. Like it's yeah. tough to feel like you're not, you're not where you want to be or could be. But it's having those teachers that, you know, I still consider them my teachers. You know, like they're they shape me, and maybe for good or bad. So this is a big commission I'm I'm working on. Yeah. This is you know again you're you're working all these different partnerships and levels whether it's it's galleries private commissions are a big part of the fine art world and you got to be careful with them because they can really slow you down and bog you down because they can involve what you don't want to work on thankfully I'm absolutely so stoked about this painting and the guy that's commissioning it is fantastic and yeah. working with him has been nothing but like a a life building experience right. you know but some commissions can get you down in the trenches and feel a little little harsh but yeah that's zion canyon and i this half is still in grisai mode so it's it's just an umber painting there's no color there you can see this part's got some color so when i finish this show and kind of get back into the painting grind this will be a part of that that glazing and color -fying, all of that making it look really cool yeah do you so, want to talk about what grisai painting and uh Umber painting is. Oh yes, well grisaille is, is just the French word for gray, is my understanding. Yeah. The painting, that, that obsession is, is what we'd call indirect painting. So instead of mixing a color and putting it on and having it be like a stuck thing there, like like a piece of tile you lay down, that's how yeah. a lot of painters work in the modern way. It's a great way of painting. But indirect painting is where you do this black and white or gray scale grisaille structure. So you're solving all your values, all your compositions, some of your paint thickness stuff is handled there. You're basically breaking down that creative process into steps instead. And coloring is one of the last pieces you do. And so you thin the paint down with other oils, you know, linseed or walnut oil or whatever the paint's usually made out of. And you're able to glaze it across. You're thinning that paint out. And so you're not doing that stacked tile that's laid on. It's more like you water it down with oil, you're diluting it and putting it across. So you can get really beautiful luminance out of it because there's light passing through that color layer hitting the value and shining back out. Yeah. It's also just easier because you have all the value handled. So I can just sit there and scrub around on colors and be like, hmm, more blue or more red or whatever. It's it's very flexible. And for a large painting, we talked about earlier, like how you tackle big work. Sometimes it is in that process of separating them down. And yeah. that helps me tackle something like this because I'd be able to draw it all in with paint, know it looks awesome. Color is just like the icing on the cake. Something like that drawing you see behind me over there, it's it's incremental stages. We weren't doing color, we weren't doing paint, we were doing just drawing. And that allowed me to focus more clearly, to build build that mental reservoir, those neural highways that you gotta form. It's just on one thing at a time. Trying to tackle it all, it just becomes overwhelming. Yeah, well, and even something like working on figures uh, probably does help quite a bit with your with your landscape work, right? Oh yeah, learning to draw, learning, learning that careful eye. And that's a piece that I think, if in landscape, I see a lot of people rely on what you could maybe call fundamentals or not even fundamentals, but like uh, conventions, yeah. you know, like, oh, a tree is green. Right. You know, a tree has branches that go like this. Like you watch a kid draw a landscape, 
they're not too far off from like the Bob Ross element of like, oh yeah, there's a mountain, there's a tree, there's a thing, there's a little sun with the glowing thing. Like we can have these conventions we follow, but real beauty I think is in that nuance and your artistic vision, that poetry that you get to create comes from your vocabulary. Yeah. That childish vocabulary is only capable of so much communicating. Right. And the figure, I think learning to draw the figure, you're talking about the most complex, challenging thing to draw. And being able to do that makes drawing a pine tree much easier. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your materials and stuff? Uh, like the canvases you use, the type of oil paints? Well, th so this is an example that you can get a better view of that it's a lot of the texturing that's happened in here was all done with acrylic paint first. Yeah. So I did an acrylic underpainting, basically that grisaille technique, but with texture paste, it was able to create a more textured surface that was a fun thing to get to do, and it dries way faster than oil paint. Yeah. So being able to be in that, I wouldn't necessarily classify this as a mixed media painting, but in theory it is, and I'm not leveraging the acrylic paint and the final product, oil's covering the whole painting at this point, but this was definitely a experiment in that mixed media approach and trying to leverage successful things with acrylic with successful things of oil that I loved. So being able to modify the colors. I mean, I painted this whole background in probably four hours. Yeah. That's super cool. Only because I had all that acrylic underpainting and the acrylic piece took its own time, you know, say four hours of acrylic painting, rendering all that out, another four hours and color just like magically happens. It was a fun piece going that route. And then I paint on aluminum. So you can see this is a three foot by four foot painting. There's a little wiggle there, a little play, but once it's in a frame, it'll be completely stable. And there's a big push in trying to, if you're gonna paint on canvas, mounting it, because when you see an old painting with cracks in it, it's mostly because that underlying surface is really flexible. The canvas is both physically movable, but then it's changed with humidity, temperature, all that stuff changes those fibers. So painting on something like aluminum and plastic is a much more inert, stable material. So I switched that a couple years ago and absolutely love painting on it and just gesso the surface up and it, it looks really clean on the other side. This one, yeah, so it's got this protective layer on it and I can just peel it off, which is also satisfying. And then I put a little label on the back. Yeah. So if we're gonna talk even, you know, slight diversion, but my process then in finishing a painting, it feels so good to have that like just shiny white finished backdrop on the painting. And I fill out labels yeah. that have my title, the year it was made, various details, if, again, like the mediums that are involved in the painting, just for archival sense. If someone's gonna go work on my painting in a hundred years, they can not be surprised that there's acrylic underneath of it. Um, and then I write a blurb about the piece, whether it's some wandering thought I might've had, or maybe location information, that kind of stuff. Oh, and I found that the galleries really love it, and the people that buy the paintings really love it, and it feels a little cooler to have just a bit more information. If yeah. you can find like an old painting with nothing on the back, it's like, our words carry a lot, and being able yeah. to use them is fun. Right, so as a creative zone, I'm very lucky to have this much playground, this much room, and one of the things over here, my, my drawing table has ended up being a complete mess, but some of it is, is mess and some of it's ah, creative fun. Over here in the corner, you'll find some of my Warhammer models that I paint. Miniature painting has been a part of my life since I was like a little kid. Yeah. My dad used to do model railroads. We made models. So having these little models is, it's a creative break away. It gives me something to do that's much simpler and more pleasing than painting, yeah. paintings for art's sake, but it has been a fun place of also experimentation. So this painting here is an example of that. I did an acrylic underpainting first, handling all the drawing of this complicated, complicated character, more complicated say than like the trees and stuff I normally paint, yeah. and was able to just draw it in black and white and then glaze that color on yeah. and make like that glowing effect from that laser. Like, I mean, it was yeah. super fun. And it all was from this kind of goofing off element. You know, it's like one step leads to another yeah. and it allows for some of that creative breathing room and an experimentation that I think if you can get stuck in a rut. So yeah. following the rabbit trail sometimes is useful. It also is extremely distracting. Like yeah. there's parts of me that want to just put this all away while I'm 
getting ready for a show because I just get tempted to come over here and paint for like 10 minutes and it turns into two hours. Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel like most painters I know and most are, I guess, creative people, they have all these like weird sorts of crazy hobbies that don't seem lucrative or useful at all at the start, but then they turn into these things that end up being like the way they make their living or something, you know? Oh yeah, I mean, that's the fan art, even doing, you know, I posted a couple of these Warhammer paintings I did, just the like fan pages and people were, they wanted to buy them yeah, first yeah. of all, but then they didn't want to buy fine art price items like that. But they were they were fans, you know. They were really stoked about it, yeah. and it feels good to be a part of that and to use my skills just to help people feel happy. You know, it's it's one thing to make art for people; it's a very weighted thing, making fine paintings for fine clients, and like this is just goofy. It's fun. It's yeah. it's it's a feels like a shake off, you know. And yeah. and so it's it's great to have that as a as a part of my life and re refills my cup a little bit, but definitely takes over my drawing board sometimes. So I got to got to reboot it sometimes. Right now it's all frames too. So normally I've got a bit more working space here. The artistic language, like illustration was always something that really fascinated me. Yeah. And it's tough because economically it's maybe not the same structure it used to be, but I, I'm able to flex my little childhood love and do some things like that, that, that yeah. there's an artist named Carl Kopinski. Oh, I'm a giant fan of Carl. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, Carl. Yeah, so like yeah. Carl is why I like Warhammer. Yeah. It's, yeah. His drawings and his little paintings he did that were in the books from my youth yeah. made me love this. It, yeah. The models are fine, they're cool. You know, I'm not like I'm so much of a model fan, but Carl's paintings yeah. did it. Ooh. Yeah, I, I follow him on Instagram. And he, he did a couple of Proko videos yeah, that I was around for, and so, it was so, so awesome. He's so good. That's, I think, the power of art. That story and that connection is more than these models, it's more than the game you play with them. There's like this mystique that comes with the visual language, and it's so fun to let loose and let some of that happen. Absolutely. Well, I feel like there's some uh, element of like, it doesn't matter what it is, it's just, you know, connecting with other people fundamentally, whether yeah. it's like these epic landscape paintings or, you know, like Warhammer sketches or anything, yeah. you know, it's just like trying to communicate cool ideas to people. And stuff. Oh, it's one of the joys of being an artist. There's something there to communicate what it was like, but there's the deeper human element of saying what's it's worth. Yeah. And I think of Thomas Moran or Beardstadt and those guys that they communicated almost that rule of cool. Like this is what the landscape feels like. There's no place that looks like a Thomas Moran painting really, but we all know that feeling. And when we're in those places, we can be reminded of it. And that's that's such a cool part of art. If I think of being up in these places, like I don't remember the blisters or the bugs that were annoying me or whatever. It's like there's this other piece that you transport into and those memories fall away and you get left with this mythology that wasn't even what really happened. And, and so it's, it's fun to think of that when you're painting, you know, like especially in that academic background, like everything has to be perfect and to nature and studied carefully. And like, it's good to learn that way. But when you come to the art making, don't forget that nothing's real, that your memory of this space is as blurry as anybody else's. And even though we have cameras that capture that stuff, your job as an artist is to speak into that, that mythology. And yeah. that's so much more fun than copying a tree. For example, let me, let me roll this oh, down. Epic. He's oh, the Hughes oh. Model 3000. You should edit like angel singing right now. It's like, ah. if this, this is without a doubt of the things in my life I've spent money on, the best decision I have ever made. Yeah. Just like to paint on this and to have this counterweight, when I'm working on a large piece, I have to still pinch myself. Like yeah. there's still just this giddy joy in getting to slide it around yeah. and, and free float it around to work in different areas. It just makes the whole process so accessible. So a good easel, do yourself a favor. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's this is one of the best things ever of all time. How much was it? It was $3,000. And I don't want to necessarily tell him, but I would have paid double now that I have it. This is worth it. It's a, it, they're built so well and they're so perfectly engineered that like I will never buy another easel for the rest of my life. Yeah, Hughes Easels is the brand. Like, it was one of the weird initial investments that didn't make any sense at all, but all my professional artist friends had them and I was so jealous and I wanted to paint big and the easel I had literally made it hard. Yeah. Not that it just was there and was annoying, it made it hard. It would drop paintings, it would just like, it was one of the worst easels ever designed. And I won't go into more about it yet, but it's, to work with something like this, sped up the process, made, increase the level of joy, like that's where I think people can affix it, right? It's like, oh, if I had a Hughes easel, I'd make better paintings. No, you won't. Yeah. Like if you're gonna make good paintings, the right tools can make it better and easier, but that creative process going on in your brain, that's not a thing that comes from here yeah. or from any brushes I might have. There's no tabla ray that's gonna make you a better painter, you know, but these kind of things help 
get rid of problems. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Like this is this is an example right here. This speaking of getting rid of problems. See, I'm giving out the gold here because this is one of the best things I've also ever ran into. It's a magnetic tray that has a oil clay, a pastelina, I think is what the brand of it is. Yeah. And I can just stick my brushes in there. That's super handy. Yeah. It's super. You should charge people for that. I know. I should yeah. start making them myself. It's just clay stuck yeah. in a thing, yeah. you know. But there's people. I've seen rice. I've seen coffee beans. I've seen different things that people put their brushes in. Nothing works as good as this. So I can either put it back in that same hole, which it holds really well, or again you just smooth it out and you can do it again. You can put different size brushes in there. You can wiggle them around. It's still a bit like yeah. it's perfect. It's I thing. perfectly solved the problem, yep. and for me anyway, everyone's got their own problems to solve. But that's like one of those hacks that's just like, man, I made my life better. Yeah. Um, another big piece that I'll talk about in regards to the studio tools and workstation is this lid that I made. You could use Tupperware, but being able to encapsulate your paint, Jurassic. I mean, you might have just smelled that. It's like yeah. holding it in a gross. Uh, <laughs> it's like, what do they call it? The term's a Dutch oven. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you Dutch oven yourself with this paint stink, but it slows the evaporation down. So this paint I put out, I put this paint out probably two weeks ago. Yeah. And if I use my little palette knife here, look at that, good to go. Yeah. So now we're saving money and we're saving materials and it's all just from using that lid. And the other secret tip you'll get a lot from people is clove oil. Yeah. So you put like a paper towel in here with a clove oil and it slows that evaporation rate down. Don't mix clove oil into the paint. Yeah. That part's not advised. But a little of that clove oil and a paper towel, and then you're saving a lot of money on paint and supplies. That and then working on glass is super, super nice, because whenever it does stick, you can use a razor blade and clean it right down. And, yeah. and so this is my main workstation. It's just a crappy old toolbox. Probably got it for 150 bucks at Home Depot or wherever. Yeah. Got brushes up here. Um, I'm kind of a brush hoarder, I would say. But actually like, with confidence say, buy these are Rosemary's. Okay, They're cool. just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but again, the brush is still, there's no magic. I wish there was like a magic wand brush. Yeah. It's like a Harry Potter brush would be yeah. so awesome. But you could paint her. They, they don't, yeah, they just. Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel like materials and easels and software and all this stuff, it doesn't make you a great painter, but I think it reduces the friction to painting. And yeah. over time, the friction, a little bit of friction over 20 years makes such a big difference where it might that is doing way less paintings. That is such a good, yeah, I think like these rocks, or these, you know, there's a place in Glacier called Avalanche, and the, like, yeah. you can see where the water is just like shaped rough rock into smooth as glass stuff that like, yeah. right, friction is powerful over time. Yeah. So I do think about that, and I think it's good that people think about their own problems, their own friction that they're, they're making for themselves. It, having a big studio, having this much space to spread out and deal with my problems, is one of those friction things like I've been in a laundry room like I've been in the 10-foot studio and like it sucks it's tough so I'm very lucky to have this kind of space yeah. it's removed some friction for me but ultimately most of my work day is spent right in this little nook yeah. you know, I'll step back to get a good view from far away but most of the time it's just right here in a, some zone of all of this this yeah. you know I, I like a cool black and gray aesthetic, but some people like more of the wood look. I yeah, might yeah. change someday, but yeah. you know, yeah, it works out awesome. Uh, anyway, take me seriously for a second here. Yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, with the microphone on it. Yeah. My name is Kenneth Yaris. <laughs> yeah, you can find me on the internet all over the place. You just Google my name, Kenneth Yaris, you'll find me. And I'm on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook, obviously. But I've got a solo show, that's what all these paintings are for, at Coeur d'Alene Galleries in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And that'll be July 14th is the opening, and that's going to be an exciting new new release of my paintings. So thanks for listening to all this banter, and thanks for following Christian and all he's doing for the art world. It's an awesome pleasure to be a part of this fun experience. You rock, man. Sweet. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Wade, for, uh, for filming today. Follow Wild Wade or Wade Holm on... Wade Holm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got I to gotta get him with a sword, though. Yeah. Wade Holm. Okay, cool. Sick. <laughs> I feel so bad because it just farts behind you on the dartboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's cool. Sick. Uh, well, uh, thanks, everybody. Bye.